I'm Scott Allen Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. I had a question come up on the channel after I did my history and foundation of Central America and explaining about the region, and they asked if I could give my opinions on the reformation of the Central American Federation or the Central American Republic. And absolutely, I'd be happy to give my opinions on that that are really baseless and come from nowhere because I really am not an authority on this, but I do have opinions on things and I like to share them. So we're gonna do that today, right after that bump. So I'm being a little bit funny in the intro, but it's true. I'm an expat living in Nicaragua. I love living in Nicaragua. I love being a part of Central America, and I do definitely have a lot of opinions about the region, but it is important to have this context. I'm an expat who's only lived in Nicaragua for so long. When I have opinions about Nicaragua, they're pretty decent. When I have opinions about the broader Central American ecosystem, it starts to get a little bit weaker. I do try to be very participant in everything in the region. I do like to, you know, really have a broad view. I have lived in Panama previously, which is not part of the region. And, you know, I have more to offer than a lot of people, but still you got to step back and be like, okay, this is an expat who loves the region, who's all in, but still an expat with a limited amount of exposure to Central America. All right, everybody got the context. Let's jump right in. So a number of years ago, just over 200 years ago, the region now known generally as Central America was a single country. In fact, if we go back a full 205-ish years, it was part of Mexico. But immediately after that, actually it's a little bit less, 203, it broke away and became its own independent empire called the Central American Republic or Central American Federation or the Federation of Central American States. It gets all over the place. They have like eight names and it's a mess. But the point is that the current countries that we sometimes refer as the CA5, right? So that's the official CA4, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala, plus their sibling nation of Costa Rica used to be a single country. This country also technically included little slivers of what is now Mexico and sometimes in disputed zones, little bits of Belize. Okay, so that is the region we're talking about. It never included any of Panama, it never included a significant portion of Belize, and it never included a significant portion of Mexico. We're going to act as though those don't exist, and we're only talking about the CA4 plus Costa Rica, or the CA5. Okay, those are the five that still have a political interest in potentially being able to discuss such a thing. Right. Does that make sense? No one else can actually talk about reforming, although someone like Belize or Panama could for you know, if they decided to jump in and have a conversation about joining. And in fact, sometimes we refer to a thing as the CA6, but it's not going to be who you think. That sixth country often associated with Central America is the Dominican Republic, which in so many ways, population, culture, weather, kind of location, acts a lot like a Central American country. It just kind of fits into our group and doesn't fit great with anyone else. It's far more like Central America than it is like a Caribbean country uh, in general, right? Like the Lesser Antilles are just way different. So it is, and this is a stretch, but plausible that if there is a serious talk of reformation of the Central American Republic, as I'll probably mostly call it, there is every possibility that the DR may jump in and be like, hey, guys, I like this idea. Can I get in on the party? And very likely that the CA4, who would likely be the ones forming the core of it, would be like, absolutely, the more the merrier. So we could be talking about a region that big, which would give us a pretty big population boost. It is a good sized country for the region. But let's stay focused on what we know more or less for sure. So the CA5 and CA4 plus Costa Rica have a much stronger history. The DR is more of a just joining later after the party. Of this region, Costa Rica really doesn't seem like it's too interested, and that's okay. They've been doing their own thing for quite some time, and they've taken a different path in life than the rest of us have. And all of us are a little bit divergent because that's why we're separate countries in the first place. But there was always a strong push for these countries to stay together because they started together, right? They didn't start as separate entities that joined. They started as a joined entity that had some physical barriers that made it make sense for the areas to kind of splinter apart. And they were kind of divided into departmentos or states be, during the colonial period before they separated from Mexico. So there was always some like arguments between them as to who had borders where, but they were very soft borders inside New Spain. But 
as they separated into the Central American Republic, they started to very carefully define their independent states. And then as that started to fall apart, they became very clearly defined independent states. And in the years since then, they've gotten really strong identities of their own. And of course, some of them have always had pretty strong identities, right? The Northern Triangle has always been a Mayan zone and the Nicaraguan and Costa Rican zone has always been a Nicaragua hinterland. And so you have these two divergent kind of areas. There's a little bit of cultural, a little bit of historical differences, but they've always been tightly integrated. And uh, the idea of exactly where the states of the different countries lie today has always been some amount of natural barrier, but most of that is relatively recent, right? But now after 200 years, each of the countries has a pretty strong identity. However, that may lead us to a really good point. When the countries were originally together, their borders were somewhat in dispute and their cultural identities were somewhat in dispute. And the people of those countries were kind of like, well, we're sort of this and we're sort of that, but we're all sort of part of this and we were part of that. Like it's the identities were weak, but that has been corrected or changed over time. Not that having an identity or not having one is right or wrong, but you know what I mean. Now the independent countries have some pretty strong identities and some really good historic, uh, uh, you know, strengths of where their borders are, what foods are considered theirs, what traditions are considered theirs, what stories are considered theirs. And now if we were to have a discussion, unlike in the 1820s, when it was like everyone was mashed together and there was a lot of like, I don't feel like I'm well represented or this group seems to be getting precedence. I think there's an opportunity now for these countries to come back together and have a little bit of a different formation. Guatemala wants to be Guatemala. Nicaragua wants to be Nicaragua. Honduras wants to be Honduras. But they can potentially create a kind of European Union style thing where they're able to keep a really strong identity with really good local cultures and traditions while sharing certain things like free trade areas, free movement of people, ability to work between regions. Um, they all share a language, so they're able to, you know, deal with some things more easily than, say, even the United States did in its early days and European Union, Union does. Now, there's a lot of advantages, a lot of reasons why getting together now would be a very different thing. Now, of course, they can't just snap and reform. It takes a lot of work, a lot of planning, and a lot of things have to align. The EU took decades to do this and had a lot of advantages, including just a lot of money that were able to make these things happen. If the CAR was to reform the Central American Republic, was to come back together, some of the big advantages would be coming up with unified currencies across the region, which would make sense. We have, but currently they have a lot of disparate ones. Putting those together would be difficult, but it could be done. If they did this and they opened the borders and they made everything very fluid, much like Europe and a little bit like the United States, because the U.S. is kind of like a collection of separate countries. It has been together so long and those countries had such weak identities when they got together that they kind of forget that that's the case. But the EU is the opposite. Central America is kind of in the middle. And so they can kind of approach that a little bit in the middle. They have single language, a lot of shared history, and only these more recent but pretty good identities. As long as they're honoring those identities and traditions, very likely they can put the rest together. And a lot of legal things overlap a lot. There's a lot of shared just momentum in politics and in the way that people want to interact, the way that they want laws. And they can still, like Europe, maintain a lot of local laws that allow for uh, careful differentiation between the countries and give different ones different balances of power and what's important to them and what's become important to them over time, but still allow free movement of people, allow for uniform uh, um, uh, you know, tariffs and taxes and a bunch of things that would allow them to operate very fluidly. Of course, I've, none of these things are simple. I'm not claiming that they are. But having a really strong outer boundary and a really unified foreign uh, interaction, that's the most important thing when you're dealing with something like this is you have to be able to interact with the, the outside world as more or less a unified entity. And that's probably the most difficult thing to overcome. But I think if you look at it, it's probably quite easy in the long run. The most difficult piece there is going to be for sure that some parts of the potential uh, Central American Republic, like Nicaragua, are very much not aligned with the United States. And places like Honduras and Guatemala have U.S. military stationed there. That's not something that's going to merge together really nicely. So those are really tough things that they would have to overcome in the long run. I don't think that if they were to come back together, though, that it would happen overnight. It's much more likely that it's going to happen in little spits and spurts. For example, Nicaragua and El Salvador could very reasonably form a small union on their own, not really operate as a single country, 
It's a little bit too much, but they could come into a tight union where they have open borders with each other, which they already have through the CA4, but they could come into a, uh, a free movement border where there's no border controls whatsoever, uh, that uh, transit happens fluidly between them, that jobs move fluidly be between them, and they can still maintain very independent polities while doing that. And I think that both of those countries are interested in that and looking towards that, that by having a free movement of people and uh, products between them, that they could both strengthen their economies significantly, and both are very much world-looking and have a lot of um, a political strengths that, that give them a good position for doing this. Plus, they're both very safe countries. Until Honduras and Guatemala are able to have similar levels of safety, nothing else is likely to really matter. So we're looking for them to be able to fix some things. They're working on that. They're just a little bit behind. That's not a problem. And if we're looking at a 10 or 20 year plan to potentially make this happen, they certainly could. And overall, I think it would be a great thing. Other than the complications, having a larger trade zone is really important for two main reasons. One is power to be able to trade with the rest of the world. Currently, all the countries of Central America are so small that their trade power with the outside world is basically zero. Sure, Guatemala, with the biggest population, can go out and tell other countries, hey, we're going to make this product, buy this product, whatever, do a deal with us, it'll be great. And those other countries are like, look, you're just too small, we don't care. You're too far away. Sure, Mexico is going to do that with them. El Salvador is going to do that with them. But further afield, like they have to go to China and make a case. They have to go to the United States and make a case. They have to plea, please send ships here. We're just not a big enough market for people to be seeking out that relationship. But if you start putting these countries together, we end up with a population much larger and that's very easily able to go out and say, we're an important uh, economic power in the Western Hemisphere and we'd be rivaling some of the larger countries of South America and easily be able to go to the Chinas, the United States, the European unions and argue for really good trade deals, right? Because we're important, we're, we have a big enough economy. It's not that as an individual, individual a person here has any less economic power it's that you like the what makes the united states and china so powerful not the individuals it's the the accumulation of all of the people within a single bargaining entity has a lot of bargaining power and so they get better rates they get better trade agreements because of those things so central america is so small currently that it needs to do what the european union did and put enough uh, independent states together and and have basically collective bargaining, but to the outside world to give it more economic power. And I think that would do a lot for this region. But even more importantly than that, because we already have okay relationships with the outside world for many of us, is having the internal ability to move products and goods throughout the region transparently. Right now, the time that products sit at borders, the amount of money it takes to move products between the countries is so high that most people just don't do it. There's so much business opportunity being lost because products are sitting for three days on the Costa Rican border waiting to be cleared to go into Costa Rica and vice versa into Nicaragua. The trucks back up for miles, the cost in drivers, in fuel, in time makes it impractical to be using that system, but we're so close. Now, if you're just traveling as a tourist, you can go right across the border. But if you have a semi loaded down with products, they're gonna sit on the border for a really long time. And that time makes economy weak. Right. So that's something all of us can can gain from. This isn't something where one of the countries is going to gain a lot and another is going to lose. Everybody will gain. Right. The ability to do business throughout the region will just explode and you will see manufacturing increase. You'll see food production increase, not just internally, but our ability to produce a lot and then sell it outside. More products will be made in the region for our own consumption. We'll start displacing things that we're currently importing because no one can, you know, like like let's just pick a thing that doesn't really exist. But let's say we were importing Twinkies here. Right, We don't actually get Twinkies here. Nobody gets them. But let's say you had Twinkies here and we had to import them from the United States because we don't have a big enough market to make them. Honduras doesn't eat enough of them. Guatemala doesn't eat enough of them. El Salvador doesn't eat enough of them. But if we all get together as the Central American Republic, suddenly all together we eat enough Twinkies to produce a locally made Twinkie-like product. So then we go out and make Twinkies ourselves and we're able to sell them within the Central American Republic. And of course, there's always the possibility, possibility that we're going to make a better Twinkie, right? No offense to Bimbo. I mean, Twinkies are pretty good, but we still could make a better Twinkie. So if we made one that's even tastier and maybe even cheaper than is what is made in Mexico, which I think is where most of the Twinkies come from, because Bimbo is out of Mexico and that's who makes Twinkies is we could potentially be selling that abroad, probably not in huge numbers, but the fact that we would take something that's being consumed locally, food or other product, doesn't matter, and we would start making it ourselves instead of buying it from the outside world, that means that we are making money by producing those products here and not sending money abroad. So 
that power of having that larger economic base can be really significant from that. But if we're then able to sell any of those products abroad, that gives us a leap forward in total economic growth for the zone. So these things are really important. So the logistics throughout the zone, free trade throughout the zone, ability to move workers throughout the zone, also very big. Right now, there is a major employment problem in Nicaragua. We have a lot of workers who are often going abroad trying to find jobs. But if we had free movement of workers to the point where any job that's in Guatemala could be picked up by a Nicaraguan, Nicaraguans could move north to Guatemala when those jobs are available. And when there's a sudden, you know, uh, drought of jobs in, in uh, of workers in Nicaragua and we have lots of jobs that we need to staff them, Guatemalans could move down here and people can shift around throughout the region in order to fill those jobs. That happens in the United States, for example, all the time. People are constantly moving between states, probably more than would be ideal. It erodes a certain amount of the culture, so you do want to be careful about this. But in the United States, it is really common. I grew up in New York. I moved all over the United States. Every time I took a new job, I moved to a new state right, and moved to a new region. Constant movement, and everyone I know is like this. Everyone I know from childhood is living in a different part of the state or a different part of the country than where they grew up, and almost never because they chose it, and almost never because they married someone, unless the whole point was they married someone and that spouse's job took them there, but in almost all cases, it was their job that took them there, right? And that's why people move around in the United States is because of work. That kind of thing could happen here, but the ability to do that, the ability to adjust your location to account for career opportunities, for open jobs, whatever, would help. And careers are a great point. We would have a better opportunity to have better health care throughout the region. All the kinds of things that you see in the United States, simply because it has a bigger population and that it's so easy to have a centralized resource, Right. In this case, for example, Leon is getting the big new hospital with the big new uh, cancer research center and the new uh, cardiac, uh, uh, cardiac center, right? All those things. Well, this would make it really easy for Hondurans to come down and use that, for Salvadorans to come use that. Why go to Mexico for that when it's right here in Nicaragua? And if there was a great, I don't know, dental center in Honduras, then we could all go there, right? Obviously not just normal dentists, but if you had like some kind of regional specialty, we could have that all throughout the region. And everyone has different products, different specialties. And that's just how it works in a larger market like that. In Europe, every little uh, country doesn't have all the resources because the neighboring country might have it. And it's so easy and quick and simple to move between those countries. And you can imagine that if we did this, we would immediately be talking about putting in trains across the region. We could do that without, but it's very difficult because of the borders. And it's very difficult because of the investment. It's very difficult to leverage the value of trains if you have to have stops at borders, if you have to have products offloaded and checked and put back on trains and just all those border controls every couple hours. That's a major problem. But if you eliminate those, and make it that trains can move people throughout the entire region really rapidly. And maybe even because it's larger, work out border agreements with like Panama and say, well, now we're a major state and Panama could allow us in and suddenly boost the Panamanian economy greatly. They only have one border to potentially have to uh, petition for that, right? Now, more likely the CA4 will form into the Central American Republic, possibly with the DR, and that border control will be with Costa Rica because it's just very unlikely that Costa Rica is going to choose to join even if the other four or five decide to. That's understood. And we just know that that may be a possibility that we may be without Costa Rica in the group. That's unfortunate, but maybe we'll get lucky and put the entire region back together again. I think it has a lot of potential, and I think it would be an amazing place to live if all of these countries had that free movement. They don't need to give up their identities. They don't need to give up their independence. They don't need to do anything of the sort. They need to make it understood that safety is a really major concern, that, that economic growth is something we're going to focus on, that border controls need to be fast and fluid with as much as possible free transit throughout, that extensions to visas happen throughout the region and are honored throughout the region. Right now, we have it's a little bit complicated. Um, there's some really minor things that could change and make it possible to put together the old Central American Republic in a new way that gives a stronger identity to the individual states. And of course, some really important laws need to be in place because the original creation of the, of the Central American Republic left most of the independent regions feeling like Guatemala City had way too much power and it just didn't make sense for everyone else to be a member. And while they did some things to try to mitigate that, it was never quite enough. And it doesn't seem ever like Guatemala is actually trying to override everybody and take over, but they are so much larger than the other states that it always represents a little bit of a risk. So a little bit of forethought on that and planning, I think, would make it pretty easy to establish that the independent regions remain heavily independent 
but they do have shared defense. They do have shared economic growth. They do have shared transit, shared logistics, and an open border system. Those things, along with a few little tweaks, I think could make the entire region just explode with opportunity. And I really look forward to seeing what is happening. Bukele in, in uh, El Salvador and uh, Ortega in Nicaragua, they are open to these discussions, as best as I can tell, to the point where they may actually be talking to each other about it. It's great to see the region at least continuing to kick the idea around. It has happened in the past that they tried putting it back together, but it always ended up falling apart. But there's been so much time, so much learning, so much growth, and the world is a different place that I think the opportunities really do exist today. Yes, it's going to be a hard road. But do I think it's possible? Yes. Do I think it's positive? Yes. And do I want to see it happen while I'm living here? Absolutely. And if it gives me the trains I want... <laughs> All the better. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. Don't forget to check out our podcast at Latin American Living on all the major podcast locations. And I will see all of you tomorrow. And just take a moment, click on one of the videos that pops up here or scroll down and find one that YouTube recommends.